So, you want to cut metal. Are you sure? Yes, I do. Really? Yes, I do. Okay, fine. You can do it. You'll need some strategies, tools, and a touch of courage. You got this. We got you. In this video, I'll take you through all the advice you need to have if you've never cut metal before, or maybe you just started, we're going to give you a little bit more to go. And maybe here, we'll have a visit from an expert. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We're going to dispel rumors and overcome your fears in this information-packed video. Let's get you machining metal. Why would you want to cut metal? Yep, yeah, that's a valid question. I think it's because you feel like a god when you do it. This is a 10 millimeter sheet of aluminum that I turned into a Pac-Man. You can go all the way down to something much smaller like this. A cufflink. You can make game pieces. This is for a backgammon set. You can make tools. This is a circle center finder. These are copper coins. A perfect constrained design project. Great for learning with a terrific result. We have a whole video covering it. Branding irons. Yeah, this is brass. This is our branding iron kit. You can make a branding iron for yourself or for someone else's business. High durability, lightweight, and general good looks make aluminum a winner for so many projects and products. Opening up the world of metal is giving yourself a whole nother place to go on your CNC journey. You don't have to buy absolutely everything. You don't have to have air on your machine, although that is nice. You can blow it by hand for your first project. Alternatively, put a chip fan on your collet. It's standard equipment on our Nomad 3 machines and now we have our 3D printer catalog. You can print one up, it works great. Throw it on your Shape Oko, the same principles apply. Whether you're running an ER11 or an ER20, those fans will clear some chips. Whatever you decide to make, you're gonna to wanna to invest in some tooling. Single flutes are where it's at for metal work. Our 278 and 274Z single flute end mills are definitely important pieces of your success. When it gets down to tinier features, you'll use a 501 PCB end mill and the standard 1 16th and 1 32nd end mills. For those finest of details, you're gonna to wanna to pick up the MC Etcher diamond tip drag engravers. They are so good on metal, absolutely one of my favorites. Even before you decide to cut metal, people are trying to sell you coatings. Some are designed to increase wear resistance, cut a particular material, make your cuts smoother or faster, all in a bid to increase productivity. In your very first cut, you need none of these things. You probably don't need any of them in your third cut. We offer seven different end mills that have zirconium nitride coatings on them. You'll get better cut quality, you'll get longer life out of these end mills when you're doing metal all the time. So as soon as you're ready to plan a ton of metal projects, definitely dive into the alphabet soup of coatings. Until that time, just get cutting. Let's clean up some misconceptions right now. First off, you can't cut metal with a belt-driven CNC. False. We've cut lots of metal projects here with the Shape Oko 3, 4, and 4 Pro. You're definitely in the game with belts. You're also going to read that you can't cut metal with a trim router, and especially not on a belt-driven machine. Oh yeah? Shape Oko 3 with a trim router. It's all about finding a recipe that works for your setup, and then you can do whatever you want. When it comes to the Z-axis, Shape Oko has been ready for a long time. The Z-plus is plenty good for metal. If you have an HDZ, even better. If you have an HDZ on your 3, you are all set to go. And of course, the Shape Oko 5 comes metal ready from the beginning. With software, there's lots of options out there. And there are features that might make it easier or more efficient to cut metal. You can do it with basic carbide create. The one concern is going to be plunging your bit into the material. You're going to want to go slow there. I would recommend Carbide Create Pro. It gives you engrave as well as ramping. It really makes cutting metal much more enjoyable and easier on all of your end mills, but that's up to you. No matter what you use, the door is open from basic projects to more complex. No, you don't need lubricant of any kind. We cut here dry 100% of the time. With air removing chips, you're in good shape. Your feeds and speeds should take care of your surface finish. It is not something you need to worry about at the start. And furthermore, you don't want oil and other things soaking into your MDF hybrid bed and ruining it. There are some other strategies you could pursue down the line, a slight alcohol mist, something like that. But right now, do not worry about it. You don't need it. It's not something you need to concern yourself with. When you cut, start easy and expect to just go through some material. You can face off the top of a block and you can even start with thin stock and a thick end mill. 
Make your end mill stronger by using a quarter inch and make your material weaker by thinning it out. Go ahead and just make some pockets somewhere. Don't even have it be a part of an actual project. Just test, can I cut out a circle? Can I cut out a pocket in a square? What are my results? How is the surface finish? You can start to learn and not be under the pressure of, I have to complete a project. The reason to start with thinner stock is so that you're not cutting deep channels. There, you're gonna want air blast for sure, a little bit more than a chip fan. You can do it by hand, but then you're stuck doing it by hand. You're also gonna be told to worry about things like deflection, chip welding, and optimal chip load. At Carbide 3D, we've got you covered. Inside Carbide Create, you'll find a breakdown by machine, material, and end mill with basic fees and speeds to get you started. These are not gonna be ideal for every situation you can come up with, but they're gonna give you a basis point from which to learn, and that's the point. When it comes to deflection, that's something that's way down the line. It's not a concern. Now, the discussion about chips. Are they too big? Are they too small? Are they the right shape? What should they look like? I'm gonna have Winston chime in here in just a little bit. When it comes to chip welding, well, that might occur. In fact, most definitely it's gonna to happen to you. You're gonna clog up an end mill. Don't worry, nothing is lost. Buy yourself live for 10 bucks off Amazon. It'll bring your end mill right back to life. And as a bonus, if you put it down the drain, you'll never experience a clog again. For optimal chip load, let's just take a deep breath. It doesn't matter right now for people who are just trying to get started. Just let yourself, let it go. If you wanna do math later, go ahead. In fact, there's lots of different ways to figure out if your cut is coming out the way you want it and none of it involves optimal chip load. When it comes to work holding, it's same as it ever was. You need to tighten things down, and if you're a little bit concerned, then go with two methods of work holding. I have occasionally used both the super hold kit along with some clamps, just to be sure. One more concern, if I break an end mill, life as we know it is over. Nope, it's part of the game. Don't want a broken end mill? Cut HDPE, only HDPE. You'll read about all of these things on the internet. Don't let them stop you. I know you're still feeling nervous. I get it. So let's bring in some engineering expertise. My source when I'm struggling. Let's go find Winston. All right, I grabbed him. The resident expert. Here we go, Winston Moy. When you're starting with metal, what should you start with? Aluminum, brass, copper, any of the above? In general, I think aluminum is the easiest. All metals have a range of different alloys that some are better than others. In general, aluminum is softer and easier to cut than copper or brass. So I think that's the best starting point. Um, if you're not sure about uh, what to cut or what you can cut or what you can cut safely, start with aluminum. Okay, easily attainable aluminum. You can go to any metal shop and grab it. You can order it online. That's a good point. Price yeah. is another factor. You can okay. usually get aluminum cheaper than copper or brass. So aluminum alloys where should you go does it really matter that much so if you're interested in the metallurgy you mm -hmm. can figure out what all those different numbers mean what they correlate to um, but for us in the united states 6061 is kind of like the gold standard for like what you start with in engineering if you want to go crazy aerospace stuff you go 7071 or something in that series but 6061 is kind of your all-purpose aluminum and it cuts pretty well um, there are other alloys that are softer and gummier and that are more difficult to cut. Keep it simple for, for starters. Your, your run-of-the-mill 6061 aluminum is a great place to start. Yeah, it seems like cost would start to be affected there too. Yeah, I mean you want to buy alloys that are common. Uh, like there are certain alloys that are more corrosion resistant. There are different aluminum alloys if you want to make cookware, things like that. Um, but un unless you're making something food safe, just don't overcomplicate things. Get what you can get easily, um, but also make sure that it's machinable. And one great resource for that is McMaster. When you go search through metals, you can click the little drop down at the top of like the metals category, and it gives you a broad overview of like, hey, these alloys are good for machining, these alloys are good for welding, these are corrosion resistant, whatever, but you really just care about what's best for machining. Okay, educate yourself and remember your very first project, not going to space, and you're probably not cooking with it. Now, when it comes to thickness for my first project, what would you do in terms of selecting a thickness of material or object to make? So once you get started cutting, if you have good speeds and feeds, like cutting a half inch part is no different than cutting a two inch part. Um, but until you get those fundamentals down, starting with something thinner is probably gonna be much less stressful. 
Um, so my kind of rule of thumb is whatever your cutter diameter is, maybe start with that. And that way you don't need to worry about getting the chips out of the cuts, because as the cuts and the pockets get deeper, chips start piling up in there, and you get issues unless you have air blast or a vacuum to get those chips out of the way. Right. So one times the diameter of your cutter is about a good guideline. So if you want to cut something thin, like eighth inch, maybe get an eighth inch piece of aluminum. Okay, you touched on fees and speeds just briefly there, and Carbide Create will get you started, but how do I know if I'm in the range aside from if I've broken an end mill? There's a lot of science and math behind this, so you could look at chip load, um, which is like, imagine the cutter going through like a piece of cheese. How thick is that piece of cheese that you just shaved off? Imagine that, um, going through a piece of cheese. <laughs> I'm talking to the expert cheese machinist here. Um, but just that, that math about how fast your cutter's spinning, how fast the cutter is advancing, gives you a chip thickness ratio uh, that you can use to apply um, to all sorts of different aluminum uh, alloys or copper, steel, whatever. And these are things that certain manufacturers of end mills will provide. So if you want to go down that path... Um, that's a rabbit that's, hole. It is a very deep rabbit hole. Yep. Maybe not for your first couple projects, just start simple and, and don't overcomplicate it. Um, so but, wait, so go back to the beginning and start simple for me and don't overcomplicate so it. So if I'm not an engineer and I don't care about chip load, what am I looking for? You're looking for, one, longevity of the end mill. If you're spinning at like 24,000 RPM and you're feeding at like an inch or two per minute, like you won't break the cutter, but eventually uh, the cutter is going to dull itself or the workpiece is going to get scorching hot. So okay, at the end of the day, something to look for. Yeah, All you're right. trying to balance two things really. Uh, you don't want to damage the workpiece or your work holding because if you're using double sided tape or super glue, that heat can actually weaken the bond. So not great and you're also trying to maximize your investment in the end mill, so you don't want to burn out the end mill too quick. Mm. So finding the right balance of speeds and feeds maximizes kind of those two things. How much of this can I see in the actual chip sizes when what's coming off of my block or sheet? Uh, usually, you, the, unless you're using like a 16th inch end mill, the chips that you're seeing coming off the cut shouldn't look like dust. Like they should mm. actually have a little bit of thickness. Like they should look like confetti more than anything else. Okay, that's good to know. And you said work holding. Okay, so work holding, some is affected by heat, but in my first project, hopefully I'm not creating a ton of heat. What can I do to mitigate or respond to work holding concerns before I start when I'm worried about all the forces involved? Um, I would say with your first cuts, start simple. Like cut something out of aluminum, um, but don't get super fancy with your work holding. Start with clamps. Clamps are foolproof. Mm. Um, but for redundancy, I would suggest uh, at least three points of contact on your, your workpiece. Okay. I've done small sheets of, of like aluminum or copper, and I just put two clamps on either side, and if one of those gets loose, everything is going. Yeah. Like it's just gonna fly off your machine. So at least three points of contact if you're using clamps, or if you're using double-sided tape, um, just periodically, personally, I would maybe pause the cut, uh, kind of like gently like feel it, see if the workpiece is getting hot, uh, and if everything is like you can touch it without like recoiling in pain, then you're in good shape. So if you burn yourself, that's bad. Otherwise, you're all right. Okay, last question. And I've wanted to ask you this for a while, but I haven't. Vacuum versus air, can I run sweepy with an aluminum project? So you actually could, I think. Um, and I, I've known some people who do use sweepy with uh, mm -hmm. aluminum cuts. The thing to remember is, uh, the reason you use air blast or vacuum is to get chips out of the way of the cutter. Yeah. Because if your cutter is just swimming through a, like, a bunch of chips, it's, you're going to get a dirtier cut, you're going to wear down your tool faster. Um, you might catch one and break the end mill too, whereas yeah. wood, that's probably not going like to happen. Or you, you clog the cutter and then you have to use that, uh, that trick with sodium hydroxide to right. dissolve that the aluminum, restore the cutter. But ideally, you don't get to that point in the first place because that's going to ruin your cut, that's going to ruin your project. Um, so the whole point about um, vacuum is it's most effective in shallow pockets, shallow cuts. Mm -hmm. So if you're cutting thin sheets of metal, it's probably just as effective as air blast. But once you get to cutting half inch, one inch thick pieces of aluminum, then those chips are going to sit in the, the valleys of the cut in the pockets 
and they're not really gonna get picked up by a vacuum. So you need like compressed air to get those out of the way of your cut. Okay, as you move along in your projects, make sure you're putting compressed air on your machine or if you like standing there while you're cutting. You could do that too. Yeah, you can do that. I did that for a while back. All right, what, what did you make? I know we said last question, but I, I do wonder, what have you enjoyed about cutting metal and what have you enjoyed making out of metal? There's, there's so many things that I've made in metal that it's hard to pick one favorite, but it comes down to, at the end of the day, you have an idea for what you want to make and you've got a very specific material you want to make it out of. Sometimes you want to make something out of wood, sometimes you want to make something out of metal. And it just comes down to like, when you hold it in your hand, is this a satisfying object? And sometimes it has to be aluminum to have the strength that you want or the look that you want. Um, and a lot of times too, it's, it's not just once you get the part off the machine, it's, it's good to go. Sometimes a little bit of polishing, a little bit of finishing, deburring, really yeah. brings it to the next level. Um, so if you have an idea for something, don't just think like, oh yeah, it's going to come off the machine ready to go. Um, but think about it as like a part that you would show off in your house. You really want to like either polish it up, brush it, bead blast. There's so many ways you can enhance an, like a metal project. That kind of openness, it's just like woodwork, right? You could, yeah. you could take something right off the machine, but it's not till you sand it a little, you put a finish on it, that it really starts to shine. And I think looking at a metal project, that's not just say cutting out a wrench or a gear, uh, but something you can really invest your time into finishing and then being proud of the finished product. Um, that's what I find the most satisfying. So you've never worked at Kern Precision? No, I have not. <laughs> <laughs> Do not watch that channel. I know you're gonna go look it up, but ridiculous what they have coming off machines there. Yeah, like we're talking like disco balls that come off the machine, like with a mirror finish on every side. It's insane. Yeah. But for us, I mean, we're trying to make functional parts. And it could just be that it comes off the machine ready to go, but I think a little bit of manual labor can really elevate it. And watching that transformation is really the best part of uh, making aluminum projects. Should people cut metal? They absolutely should. You heard him. Do it. Good stuff from Winston there. I know all that information has undoubtedly provoked more questions on your end. Put them in the comments, we'll be happy to answer them. But remember, the best teacher is experience. Get out and cut something. That's how you're gonna gain the most answers. All right, we'll be back here in the studio with more information, ideas, and inspiration.